Malachi 6, I mean 1, 6 through 8. Whenever you're ready. Okay. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name, and ye say, wherein hath we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of the Lord is contempt. Yes, contempt of and if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will, will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord. Okay. So I wrote that the first thing that stuck out to me was like the beginning of six. Um, how like if we honor our fathers and we, we fear our masters or like you could say like employers or like people like position, like why do we not fear and honor God? Mm -hmm. And then I also put like the second thing was that like the priests were kind of disrespecting God with their like apathetic sacrifices. It was like incorrect to what he wanted. What what is what is the sacrifice that they're offering? It's, uh, the priest? Well, they're doing like they'll do stuff that they didn't really need, mm. or like stuff that was kind of convenient to them. So it was what, like, what what is what is the greatest sacrifice? He kind of hinted to it. What is the greatest? Bryce kind of hinted to hint it towards it. But what is the greatest sacrifice you can sacrifice to God? Your, Yourself, or yourself. So, if you're a priest, what is the greatest sacrifice besides himself can he offer to God? Um, well, I mean, you're you're as a priest, you're kind of like over everyone. You're you're you should set an example, and you're you're they're not basically what they were doing is there. You go really bad. Good job. And then I put hey, that's the young folks, guys. That's the, the young folks over here with Malachi breaking down Malachi. Gotta love it. Go ahead. I put that the sacrifices they gave, like God, were like waste, and, like things they already kind of wanted to get rid of. And I kind of related this to like, or like just an example would be like prayer or reading the word. Like when people just read or like pray whenever it's convenient, wherever they don't have time to do anything else, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, I have nothing else to do. I guess I'll just pray or I guess I'll just, and instead you should find time out of your day when it's busy. You should like not just do it when it's convenient to you and you should seek and find time for it. Great. Good. Good. Revelation. I love it. Revelation. You should find time. I like that. I like you should find time. In other words, can you have a relationship with another human being if you don't prioritize that person? So how much more so should we prioritize God? A lot. Yeah. yeah. Also put that like, or in, in eight, there's, he's like, would you offer this to your governor? Like, they like put people of authority or like people that they believe are like higher than God above him. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people today, like they're so worried about pleasing other people that they don't like really think about pleasing God. There you go. We're done guys. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's going to be a short Bible study. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Good job though, Rose. Really good job. I'm proud of you. I'm proud that you are, are, are looking into the word past the words, right? Uh, a lot of times we read scripture, and I've heard people say many times, uh, older men and women, I've read the Bible five times, ten times. You got to look past reading the Bible. You got to look into what the Bible was saying to you. And it's a good thing when you're as young as you are. And I'm going to tell everybody your age, but you're young. Uh, if you were my daughter, you would be my youngest child. So that hint, hint, you're, you're young. So that being said, uh, it's good that you're already looking past the words and you're looking into exactly what is God trying to say to us with, with the scripture um, that I just read. And, and that's a, a good thing as you continue to look through scripture. Uh, let me give you a hint. And I said this to, to uh, the boys, when you're reading the Bible, if you're reading a book such as Malachi or one of the other prophets and at the beginning of the book, every time there's a new chapter within that book, that first chapter is kind of like the synonymous, the synopsis, the synopsis. 
So if you look at that synopsis and then you go into what's being said past that synopsis, it'll give you a really good idea. But you, you did a wonderful job in breaking it down. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great, great, great. Malachi, another great prophet, uh, talking about what we give to God. And, and to summarize what Rose just taught us, why give God your leftovers if you don't want them yourself? Right? Uh, he talks about first fruits, not what's left over. Uh, first fruits would be me prioritizing God instead of saying, oh, I got to go to work. Oh, I, I got to do this. Oh, I'm going to make it real hard. Uh, my wife. Oh, my kids. See, even my wife and kids can't come before God. Right. Um, when me and my wife got married, uh, we set up a, a, a hierarchy of priorities in our lives, and hopefully we taught them to our sons. But the priority was individual. So for her, it was God first, then her, then me, then our children. And for me, it was God first, then my wife. Um, then me, then my wife, and then my children. So yes, that's that's how we prioritize, and that's what he's saying here. Uh, we we shouldn't just give God the the things that we don't. A lot of people, like you say, uh, I don't have nothing to do, so I'm gonna read the Bible. Why not prioritize that and say I have something to do? I'm gonna read the Bible. And whatever time I have left, I'll do whatever else I need to do. So uh, that that's the thing. But the the beautiful thing as we grow older. And in, in the word, we learn that as we prioritize God, you know what God does? Prioritizes us. There you go. Thank you. And the bleacher seat. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, as we prioritize him, he prioritizes us. You know, I have people say, well, I pray, I pray. I never hear anything. Can you pray for me? Well, maybe if you stop asking me to pray and you start prioritizing before you pray, when you need him, you can call him. Right. If if you hollered at the gym, hey, how you doing? If I didn't know you, if I didn't see you, if I didn't have a relationship with you, if I didn't spend time with you, you'd just be somebody screaming, hey. But you come to the Bible study, you, you date my youngest son, you come over to our house, you eat with us, you break bread with us, you study with us. So you say, hey, now in the gym, now you got my attention. Right. How much more so God if we just ignore him over and over again and then something happens, we want a job or our car breaks down or whatever, and then we start hollering God. We've ignored him and his voice the whole time, but we expect him to answer us right now. Right. Yeah, Malachi. I like that. All right. Anybody want to add to what Rose read to us here in Malachi? Good job again, Rose. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's get to praying, and then we'll get right into the outline. That way uh, we can uh, try to get through this outline so we can get started on another one. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are God, Lord. We thank you that you are the God that created the heavens and the earth. You are the God that sanctified us through your Son, Lord, through your Spirit, through your Word, Lord. We just thank you for your Word. We thank you for your truth. We ask, Lord, as we go through this Bible study, as always, Lord, that you be here with us, that we feel your presence, and you give us understanding through your spirit, Lord. Help us to hearken unto your voice, and your voice only, Lord. Direct our paths, and lead us in the direction you would have us to go, Lord. Lord, we will just continue to glorify you, not only at this Bible study, Lord, but in our lives, Lord, as we continue to seek you, Lord. We'll point other people to what we know about you, Lord, and we'll glorify you in that, Lord, and celebrate your son, Lord, when these things we pray in your name. Amen. Everybody good? Yes. yes. I guess everybody good? <laughs> Everybody's quiet today. Uh, let's, uh, we, we're back to when a nation has gone too far. So I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to start with a senior guy, just because he's the senior guy at the Bible study today. Richard. Yes. Talk to me. What? what uh, give me a, a little synopsis of where we're at up to this point with uh, 
when a nation has gone too far. Sorry to put you on the spot, but this is about the fourth week. So give me a, sur a, a summation of what we've learned. Well, we have learned uh, that uh, nations can go too far. And before, <clears throat> before they have gone too far, uh, God sends out, uh, he have his, his, his messengers that he sends to the nations. And when they start to ignore the, the, the messengers, and then they start to ignore uh, the church, and if the church is not standing, which is where everything stands on for the nation, uh, because we are his people. And, and, and so when those, when the church start to fail and when the church messengers are not sticking to the word as they supposed to, uh, eventually, eventually God would get to the point to where he will dull their hearing and their mind so that they cannot. And then uh, once they have, at, once they have arrived at that point, then sin is running rapid, which it is today. And also uh, you're on the verge of God uh, taking an action against that nation. Amen. And so uh, I would say that uh, we are living in perilous times uh, based upon uh, everything that we have learned about how God deals with the nations and every nation that he has dealt with from the past to present. Uh, pertaining to uh, the church and his people. Great, good, good, good summation. I, I mean, I couldn't have done it no better myself. Very, very good summation. <laughs> and anybody have anything to add to what Richard said that they've learned? Yeah, I guess, I guess he did well. <laughs> good deal. Good job. Good job. Okay, so we we. We ended off in Psalms, I believe. Psalms 115, 5, 8 was the last one we read. Uh, we went over a couple other things with the outline last week. And then we jumped into two verses. The first verse was Jeremiah 5, 18 through 21. Foolish people and without understanding. And that's where we're at. And, you know, Rose gave us a good thing here in Malachi. It is foolish. And we become foolish people as a nation when we fail to prioritize God, right? Uh, when we pro put prioritize, we prioritize our leaders and we prioritize all these other things in our lives, but we fail to prioritize God, we become foolish. And he calls us that in Jeremiah, foolish people and without understanding because where are we looking to for understanding? Anybody? No, no, where are we looking? How did we get here? We got here by looking in the wrong place. So where are we looking for understanding? Other men, thank you. Other men. And those men are not necessarily basing their understanding on the word of God. And if they think they are a lot of times, what happens is they don't have understanding because they haven't straightened out their life. They haven't set up their self as a temple for the spirit. And the Bible says we can't discern without the spirit, right? We learned that uh, the disciples had to go to Pentecost after Jesus was taken up. And they had to wait on the Holy Spirit to come upon them before they received understanding, even though they walked with Christ for three and a half years during his ministry. The same thing, we have to cleanse this vessel of sin. And we have to be a willing sacrifice unto God for him to restore that same vessel holy so that we can have the Holy Spirit and we can have discernment through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Not through what I think, not through what I feel, but through the Spirit and what he reveals to us through the Word of God. Amen. So we saw that in Jeremiah. And then we looked at the Psalms. Uh, 115, 5 through 8, they that make them are like unto them idols. Uh, we become just like the things that we idolize, right? Uh, whether it's sports stars or whether it's our cars or whether it's our houses or our boats, we become just like them. 
And the thing that they have all in common, I don't care if it's sports, I don't care if it's movies or music or whatever, the, the thing that they all have in common is none of those things can save you or me from hell. Amen? They have hands, but they can't pull you out of sin. They got eyes, but they can't see you in sin. They got ears, but they can't hear what your speech is to correct it, right? They got feet, but they can't move. They can't pull us out of sin. We, we saw that in Psalms. We have a, a God that can. So we're looking at the parable, and all this is around this parable. Isaiah gives a parable. Uh, we see that in Isaiah. Ezekiel gives a parable, and we see it again uh, in Jesus' ministry. Uh, we see the parable, and we look at the parable of a vineyard, right? Who's the vineyard? Anybody remember who the vineyard was? God's people, the church, basically, was the vineyard. Who are the keepers of the vineyard? The head of the church, priests, whatever you want to call them, rabbi, whatever, reverends, whatever these denominations calls them now. Who are the servants? Hmm? The servants. Who are the servants? We, we just read one in Malachi. Who, people with Malachi? the truth. Yeah, the people he sent with the truth. Yeah, the prophets. Prophets, disciples, so forth and so on. Who was the son? Christ. Christ. Amen. Christ. So we see all these parables. We see this parable. We're breaking down this parable. And we see Isaiah starts the parable, and Jesus quotes the same parable uh, in the New Testament. So let's let's go to Mark and let's look at the New Testament. Now we've already saw uh, several different things in the Old and New Testament. Do we go to the Book of Acts? Let's see. Yeah, we did. We went to Acts. Acts. So we, we've already saw this same parable all the way to the new church, to the book of Acts. And we saw that in the book of Acts. But let's go back to Mark, to Christ's ministry. And Mark 4, 1 through 12. Derek, you want to read? Yes. And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto them unto him a great multitude that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea and the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and he and said unto them in this doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went but a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. Uh, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some fell on the stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and choked it, and yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they were about him with the twelve, asked of him the parable, and said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. Least at any time they should be converted, and when their sins should be forgiven them. Amen. Thank you. Wow. You know, Jesus comes strong with another parable. And then not only does he come with a parable, but he tells them that... Uh, the reason why he's coming with a parable is because too late, right? They, these people don't have ears to hear and eyes to see too late. But let's look a little close at what Derek just read to us. Does anything stand out to anybody? Eight. Verse 8, talk to me. Um, and... You like have a good foundation, like that's how you're gonna like 
grow fruit that's how you're gonna um, god wants you to like bear fruit and how you do it is by going to his word and getting a good foundation and setting up your life in the way that he wants you to amen right uh if if you're going to build something uh the, the, the thing to do is a lot of times the things that we as men and women don't do, we don't ever read the directions, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I love to, to get something now and I'll just say, hey, uh, Bryce, can you put that together for me? And uh, unlike me, I'll go into the garage and he's reading the directions. Uh, I, I have a, a hard time reading directions sometimes. I just want to take it out of the box and put it together. But life is the same way. We have a book called the Bible of directions. And a lot of people try to live their life without having to read the directions themselves. So that ground that Rose was telling us about in verse 8 is not a fertile ground because the ground is not cultivated with you through the Spirit and through the Word of God. A lot of times it's cultivated through a church. So if you're going to sow your seed in a church, you better make sure that church is grounded in the word of God. Amen. And who's ever leading that church, you better make sure he is grounded in truth and in the word of God. Because if not, you end up falling in some of these other places that you read beforehand. And among thorns, that could mean a church of false teachers, right? and false students, and then you grow up in that condition, and all of a sudden, you don't get the truth. That truth is choked out. You never even receive the truth. And then stony ground can be those hard-headed denominations sometimes that say, uh, well, I like pastor so-and-so, and pastor so-and-so said, and pastor so-and-so said, so I'm going to go with pastor so-and-so, but pastor so-and-so is not right with the Bible, not right with the Word of God. So he's telling you all these different things that can happen to a, a, a person to prevent them from being saved, basically. And then he goes into verse 9, right after what Rose just talked to us about, and says, And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Was there a lot of people walking around without ears back then? Hmm? No, they had ears, right? What was the issue? They, they didn't want to hear, but what, what is a, a, another thing that we have a problem with? Not just not wanting to hear. That's, that's, they couldn't die to the flesh. They couldn't die to the flesh. They had a problem doing. They didn't want to hear. What else? What happens when you tell somebody? Uh, Y'all have all been out in the world, and you tell somebody, hey, God says we have to keep the commandments. What, what do you get? They don't want to hear. They don't want to hear? Defensive? Yeah. They, we, we, we call it in the Bible, and we'll probably do a Bible study on it, but they reject God. And God says in the book, if you reject me, then I'm going to reject you. Not to not hear, knowing that you have access to truth, knowing that someone's trying to help you with truth, knowing that they're telling you what says the word of God out of the Bible, and you still reject that. You're not rejecting Richard. You're not rejecting David. You're not rejecting Derek or Bryce or Rose or Mom or Braxton or me or anybody. You're rejecting God because I'm not telling you what I think or what I feel. I'm telling you what says the word of God, right? So you're rejecting him. That's why you don't have ears to hear and eyes to see. It's not that you don't have them physically. It's that you reject what you're seeing and you reject what you're hearing, right? And then he goes into 10. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked him about the parable. Did they have understanding? No. Nope. Still didn't have understanding. Right? That's what I said. They didn't have it until Pentecost. He was always having to explain to the 12. And these are 12 men that walked with him in the ministry. Didn't have understanding. But they did what we should be doing. They were seeking it. Right, we we might not have it, but as long as we're seeking it, the Lord will provide the increase. Amen. Eleven, and He said unto them, Un, "Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto them they are without. All these things are done in parables. They're without what? 
understanding. They're without understanding. Amen. Why are they without understanding? Because they rejected the truth. Right? There's a lot of people without understanding. I have people always time to tell me, man, you understand the Bible. I don't understand the Bible. Well, I have to ask the next question is, have you read it? Have you prayed? Have you meditated? Have you got sin out of your life? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to come into you? Have you died to the flesh? Have you been baptized and born again in the spirit? Well, I haven't done all that because I don't understand the Bible. Well, that's probably a good start place, right? Verse 12, that seeing they may see not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, least at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven. Has God shut the door? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He says that seeing that seeing that they may see not. Yeah. And not perceive and hearing that they might hear and not understand, at least at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Too late. I, I, I'm not going to let them hear anymore. I'm not going to let them see anymore. And now they're going to die in the situation and circumstance that they're in. Too late. You rejected me. So God says, hey, you reject me. I'm going to reject you. The door as as. My wife just said the door is closed to the ark, right? The truth has been closed. The book is like an ark. It, it can save you. The words can save you. But they didn't want salvation. They wanted religion. Amen? Let's look at uh, the next one, Ezekiel 12, 1 through 18. Ezekiel 12, 1 through 18. You want to read, Bryce? Yeah. The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not, and have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Therefore thou, son of man, prepare these stuff for removing and remove by day, in their sight, and thou shalt remove thy place to another place in their sight. It may be they they will consider it through, they may be a rebellious house. Then shalt thou bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight, as stuff for removing, and thou shalt go forth at even in their sight, as they that go forth into captivity. Dig thou through the wall in their sight, and carry out their breath. In their sight shalt thou bear it upon their shoulders, and carry it forth in the twilight, and shalt cover thy face, that thou see not the ground. For I have set thee for a sign unto their house of Israel. And I did so as I was commanded. I brought forth my stuff by day, as stuff for captivity. And in the evening I digged through the wall with mine hands, I brought it forth in the twilight, and I bare it upon my shoulder in their sight. And in the morning came the word of the Lord, saying unto me, Son of man, hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, This burden concerneth the prince of in Jerusalem, and all the house of Israel that are among them. Say, I am your sign, like as I have done. So shall it be done unto them, that they shall remove and go unto captivity. And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight, and shall go forth, and they shall dig through the wall to carry out their body. He shall cover his face, that he see not the ground with his eyes. My net also will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken into my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, and shall he not see it, though he shall die there. And I will scatter toward every wind all that are about him to help him, and all his bands, and I will draw out with the sword after them. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall scatter them among the nations and disperse them into the countries. But I will leave a few men of them from the sword, from the famine, and from the pestilence, and they may declare all their abominations among the heathen, whither they come, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, eat thy bread with quaking, and drink thy water with trembling, and with carefulness. Woo! Amen. Ezekiel coming strong. Son of man, eat thy bread with quaking. The bread is the word, right? And the water with trembling, spirit, and carefulness, right? You need to be careful handling the word of God. You need to be careful with the spirit of God handling the word of God. And, and, and when you do handle it, you need to handle it with trembling 
Why? Because it's able to save, but it's also able to condemn, right? Well, we're going to be condemned by the same word that he gave us to, to, to learn by, right? But let's go back and look at what he said. What Bryce Red says, thank you. Son of man, thou dwellest again in a rebellious house. There's a lot of rebellious, rebellious churches and a lot of rebellious denominations saying right now that there's three gods, saying that uh, the Ten Commandments are over with, uh, that uh, once saved, always saved. Uh, the Sabbath is Sunday uh, or any day now that you want to take the Sabbath. Uh, that a woman can teach. We already went through that or preach in the church. Uh, also, uh, homosexuals are okay with God. God loves everybody. And they, they can not only be part of the sanctified, but they can teach in the church. That's a rebellious house. Amen? That's rebellion, rebellion against the word of God. If God says no, it's no. Right? You, you don't have the ability to reason with the directions. If the directions tells you this is how you build this house, and you decide to go your own way and build it another way, and the house falls down on you, whose fault is that? You're a rebellious house. And we got a lot of rebellious denominations and a lot of rebellious religions in the world today. So because of that, he says, Therefore, thou son of man, prepare thee stuff for removing and remove by day. Come out of her. Don't, don't, don't. Don't hide. Don't be ashamed. By day, in broad daylight, come out and walk out with your head up and walk out. Amen? Come out of her, my people. Don't partake in her sins, right? And her curses. That's what the Bible says. Come out of her. Then those churches. Then shall forth thou bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight as stuff being removed. Thou shalt go forth at even in their sight as they that go forth into captivity. You're going to be an example for them. You're going to be a sign for them. A sign. Something's wrong. Where, where's the prophet going? Ezekiel was a prophet. Why is the man of God leaving the house of God and the people of God? Hmm? It's not of God. Not of God. It's not of God. And if you stay there, what are you saying? That's what you're choosing instead yeah, of God. Yeah, you're, 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 you're loaning or you're giving credence to that thing, right? He's saying, come out. You say, oh, I'm going to stay here. These are my people. He's telling Ezekiel, come out. Amen. Come out of her in the daytime. Don't sneak out or whatever. Come out. Come out of her, right? Let's go skip over to uh, verse 16. But I will leave a few of them. A few men of them, the remnant, he always leaves a remnant, right? That's just learning how God works with us. All through the Bible, there's been a remnant. We go back to Noah's Ark, there was a remnant. We go back to Sodom and Gomorrah, there was a remnant. We go back to Isaiah and the Babylonian uh, Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, there was a remnant. Always a remnant of people, amen? And he shows a remnant here. I'm going to leave a few men of them for the sword, for the famine, and from the pestilence, that they may declare of their abominations among the heathen, whether they come, they shall know that I am the Lord. What did he want them to declare? No, no. Their abominations. What, what are we to do when we come out of false church? Same, Same thing. At false church. Uh, their abominations God says, for the Lord thy God is one, you say there's three. That's an abomination. I suffer a woman not to teach, and you suffer the authority of a man. You say, put a woman at the head of the church. Amen? That's an abomination. I say, God says, I made the man, the woman for the man, and you say, no, it's okay for a man to be with a man. That's an abomination. Right? We are, we, are, we are to come out and we are to highlight or present to them the abominations that cause God to leave that place desolate, right? To leave us desolate. Why is America in the position that it's in? Because it's laws all the way to the highest court 
the Supreme Court says man's ideology is right and God's is wrong. They rejected God's. It's okay for a man to marry a man. God said, no. You said, yes. God says it's an abomination. You said it's a beautiful thing. Amen? We don't call it out. Nobody's calling it out. No one's calling it an abomination what it is. And now it's creeping into the churches, uh, like Richard told us. Well, it's okay. It's okay. Well, God said, don't put the clean with the unclean. But you say it's okay? You have a choice. And, and, and I'm not saying that I'm God. I'm just saying, reading the word of God, if you're a homosexual, you have a choice. If you want to be part of the house of God, you got to play by his rules. You can't, I don't care what man you are. And if your name's on the church and your grandma's name on the church and your mama's name's on the church building, God said it's an abomination for a man to lie with a man the way he would lie with a woman, right? Mm. So how can I allow that in my, in the house of God? Don't I have a responsibility mm -hmm. as a leader? Huh? Now, okay, now don't don't get me wrong. God loves everybody. And someone will go to John and they'll say, for God so loved the world that he only gave his, he gave his only begotten son. But once that person that's in sin, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's adultery, whether it's lying, whether it's stealing, whether it's covetousness, any of them, if that person comes to God's house and says, you're going to take me the way I am, I'm a homosexual, and you're going to take me the way I am. As a man of God, I got to tell you, no, you can't come that way. If, if you were born that way in your own mind, you can be born again, right? I was born in sin. I didn't come to God and say, hey, you're going to take me the way I am. Are you going to sanctify me as a sinner? No, I came to God, and I laid the flesh on the altar and I died to sin and I said, I'm going to stop sinning and I'm going to come the way you want me to come. Right? I'm going to let the word cleanse me. Amen? The spirit cleanse me. But somehow or another, some sins we covet and we say, well, he didn't have to change. It's okay. God loves him. You know what we're doing? We're killing that person. I don't care what the sin is, adultery, lying, uh, homosexuality. If we're saying it's okay, God loves you anyway, that person's blood is on your hands. The sin is on his, but the blood is on yours because you should know the word of God and you should know that no sinner will have his place in heaven. No sinner will be with God for an eternity. All sinners will have their place in the lake of fire. So if you don't repent and turn from your sin, then I just condemned you to an eternity in hell by accepting you the way you are. Do you see that? So he's saying to them, tell them what your abominations are. He doesn't say you don't have to love him. I can love you, but I can't accept you into the fold until you're sanctified. Huh? Anybody have a disagreement? Nope. I thought that would be a little bit more uh, controversial than it was. Amen. <laughs> I don't have my controversial people here tonight. But again, why? What did she read to us? Why give God your leftovers? Why not give God a pure sacrifice? Right? It's the same thing. It's the people that we present to God as those who have understanding that has truth. You have truth. You have understanding. God is looking for a church without what? Blemish. Blemish. Thank you. Why do we keep allowing blemishes into the house of God? Put people ahead of God. Thank you, Rose. You're serving the people. You're serving the people that put... 10% in your, in your little kitty every Sunday. I ain't going to present one of my sons. I got three. I ain't going to present them to God. 
until they're right with God. And if they're not right with God, then I'm going to work and 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 I'm going to work until God calls me home to get them right with God. I do them a disservice saying, oh, I love you. My, my baby son's right here. I love you, Bryce. My, my oldest son's right here in Virginia. I love you, Derek. But I'm not going to call a sin a sin. Their blood's on my hands. Amen? Coming for a spotless church. Christ was a spotless sacrifice. You call yourself a Christian, then you are trying to emulate him. So you got to turn from sin, repent from sin, right? Pray to God, he'll hear from heaven, and he'll cleanse your land. Why do you want to cleanse it if you want to keep filth in it? If you want to keep liars, if you want to keep thieves, if you want to keep homosexuals, if you want to keep adulterers, why would you pray to him and humble yourself for him to cleanse it if all you're going to do is dirty it up again? Hmm? Just saying. 17. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, eat thy bread. Learn scripture. Learn the word of God. Learn truth. Learn your commandments. Learn what my judgments and my statutes are. And when you do learn it, learn it all, but learn it so careful that you don't miss nothing. Because if you miss something, guess what? You're going to miss the boat. Amen? Do it with trembling. Be very careful, right? In my old business, I, I, people used to say, man, you go over ops plans three or four or five times, you make them redo them two or three or four times, and then you make them regurgitate that ops plan to you themselves, sitting in your chair. Yes, I did. But why? Our lives depended on it, right? Our physical lives depended on it. Well, the same thing here. Your spiritual life and the spiritual life of your family in eternity with God is at risk, is at stake. An eternity with God. Because if you don't make an eternity with God, you know who you have an eternity with? Satan. You're going to hell. I think that's pretty important. Hmm? But no, I love my baby girl, so I don't talk to her about scripture. We don't talk about that subject because I love my son and it bothers him. Or we don't talk to our parents because truth came to us, but they're older than us. The Bible says, honor thy mother and thy father. What's the greatest honor can you give to them? Saving their souls. Saving their souls. Giving them truth. Amen? God has never raised up a coward for a day of trouble. Let me tell you that. God is not looking for cowards for a day of trouble. Everybody that served God died a horrible death. Think about that. Even the one that turned on him, Judas, what did he end up doing to himself? Hanging himself. Right? All of them that followed him died a horrible death or lived a horrible life. John, they say, I don't know if it's not in the Bible how he died, but theologians say he died on the Isle of Patmos at an old age, but I know he was bold in a pot of hot oil also. They tried to kill him. Look at the 60 million Christians that died in the dark ages because they wouldn't bow to the Pope. 60 million. Do we see uh, museums, Holocaust museums for those saints? Hmm? We, we, we had six, supposedly six million Jews killed in World War II, and, and we got all kind of Holocaust museums. What happened to the Holocaust museums for the saints that died during the Dark Ages? Hmm? How come the church never came back and said anything? How come the church never said anything? How come it's not taught in school? Huh? 
Huh? Have you ever thought about that? Who, who, who doesn't know about the Holocaust of Germany? Hitler. Anybody? Everybody heard of Hitler? Hmm? How come we don't hear about the 60 million Jews that, I mean, the, not the 60 million Jews, the 60 million Christians that were killed? Hmm? Just asking. The church doesn't teach it and we don't say anything about it. We keep it hush hush. But again, Ezekiel speaking here, come out of her. Don't partake in her sins and be an example to her. And not only be an example by leaving in daytime, but tell her what her abominations are. People say, well, Freddie, you, you, you know, you're, you're tough. You're a hard guy to listen to, man. What am I not doing what he just told Ezekiel to do? Huh? Am I better than Ezekiel? No, I got to do what the word of God says. He tells me to tell you, I'm telling you. Amen. Let's go to Romans. Romans 11, 1 through 12. David, you want to read? Uh, you're too far. I don't think we can hear you. David, you there? What chapter? I was trying to see if David was there. Uh, chapter 11. Romans 11, 1 through 12. I'll read. I say then, has God cast away his people? After you hear everything that just went on with Ezekiel, you have to ask yourself that question. Has God cast away his people, the church? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul talking here. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not? What the scriptures say of Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at the present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But it, if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. What then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election has obtained it. And the rest were blinded according as it is written god has given them spirits of slumber eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear until the day unto this day today and david says let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their backs always. I say, then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the, the, the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Amen. So God is looking at Israel and he's looking at Israel as a nation of people. Like I said at the beginning of this Bible study, a nation within a nation. And they fail to do what they were supposed to be doing for the rest of the world, which was being the salt and the light of the world, which we were supposed to do. Right. So God is going to restore Israel on his own because he used them for a purpose. And he's saying, I'm going to restore some of them, a remnant. Again, all the way through the Bible, we hear about a remnant. But to the most of them that think they have it right or thought they had it right, because they had religion. Paul himself had religion. They call Paul a Jew of Jew. 
right? A Hebrew of Hebrews, right? He was he was a learned man. He learned from one of the top Pharisees in the church at that time. But did he know Christ? No. Because on the road to Damascus, when the Lord talked to him, what did he say? Who are you? Right? Well, who are you, Lord? Well, you would think if you really knew who he was, you would recognize him when he called you, right? Who are you, Lord? And, and if you really knew who he was, would you prosecute him? What did God ask Paul? Why do you what? Persecute him. Didn't even know who he was. And that's the way we are in church today. If God was to show up and arrest us on the road to Damascus, most of us would not know who he was. If, if he showed up Saturday at the church, the sad thing is most of those people would be out playing softball or barbecuing or fishing or skiing or hunting. And then you say, well, God, I thought you were going to come on Sunday. See what I mean? You don't even know who he was. And then what is he going to say to you? I gave you my Sabbath. I gave you my Sabbath as a sign, just like he told Ezekiel he was going to be a sign. I gave you a, my Sabbath as a sign that I am the God that created the heavens and the earth. So hallow my Sabbath and keep them holy. Isn't that what he said? Hmm? The only reason I know he says that is because I read the book. That's what he says. So what is my excuse now? Oh, I was waiting for Sunday. You think God's going to say, oh, it's okay. I'll come back. Tomorrow. Huh? Oh, you thought it was Sunday. Y'all going to have church tomorrow. Nobody told me uh, I I'll be back Sunday. That's how high and mighty men think they are. They can dictate God's holy day. And did it. And all the denominations fall, fell, and bow their knee, just like he said to Bell. He's looking for those who haven't bowed their knee. Didn't, isn't that what he said? Looking for those that haven't bowed their knee to bell. Right? Read truth. God is not going to say to you, oh, it's okay. You came on Sunday. Oh, you know what? You, you work on the weekend, so you know what? Uh, Tuesday's okay. If you want to honor me on Tuesday, that's fine. You're still honoring me. You wouldn't even do that. How stupid is that to think God would do it? I had somebody tell me the other day, well, every day is the Sabbath. Did God tell you every day was the Sabbath? Huh? Can you show me anywhere in this book that God says every day is the Sabbath, honor every day and hollow every day, and, and, and I'm good with that? Huh? I've never seen it. I've never seen it, but you have church leaders that'll get up there and say, well, every day is the Sabbath. Jesus came and every day is the Sabbath now, or my Sabbath is in Christ. You don't even have rest in Christ yet. Why? You ain't dead. The Bible says it's once for a man to die and then judgment. Once you go through the judgment, then you have your rest, right? But no, no, God's going to change for us. That's this pollution that the Bible was talking about earlier, remember? Pollution. I need to do a Bible study on that. But pollution, that, that's all this stuff that has come into the pure water and, and the, the pure food. Are you going to eat at a table that's polluted? Right? They, that's where they want to eat. You know the table that they don't want to eat at? The one that's going to be a stumbling block. The one we just read about, right? Why do you think he says that table is going to be a stumbling block? Anybody? Because it challenges their beliefs. It challenges their belief. It, they refuse to go to the word of God. They like their religion. They like their dogma. They like their teaching. They like their pastor. And, oh, I like the music. And, oh, his son sings so good. And the music is so good. And you know nothing. You don't even know what's on that table to eat. And the things that are on the table that God puts on the table, you refuse. But you think you're sanctified. And you tell your church they're sanctified. 
and you tell people in the church to sanctify. And then the whole church becomes defiled. And like Richard says, once the church is defiled, who is going to be the litmus test for the rest of the nation? Huh? If we can't even be the litmus test for our own house, and then we go to God's house with that mess, how are we going to go to the rest of the world like Ezekiel had to? Jeremiah had to. Isaiah had to. The prophets had to. We can't even do it in our own house. Amen? Second Peter. Let's go to Second Peter. Second Peter 1 through 21. Second Peter 1, 1 through 21. I'll read. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus. I'm not in the right place. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not in the right place. Uh, uh, 2 Peter. There we go. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 1 through 12. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given us, un us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruptions that is in the world through lust. And besides this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to the virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Make your calling and election sure as studying the word of God with trembling right, and fear. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be neglected to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that surely I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. 16, you can highlight that. For we have not followed cunning device fables when we made known you unto you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitness of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Good thing to highlight. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Peter, Peter telling you, you have a way out. Peter telling you, you have an escape. Peter telling you, you have a Messiah. 
Peter, Peter telling you, you have light in a dark place, right? But he says, be careful. Why do you think he tells you to be careful? Yeah, you're going to be judged off that knowledge. You're going to be judged on what you know and what God has put in you. But also, be careful that some man don't take it from you, right? Be careful that someone doesn't mislead you. And everything that you did know, he gives you a different perspective. So you run toward his perspective instead of what God gave you. God, he's telling you and he's assuring you that God's way is the way. And not only the way, but the only way, right? It's the only way that can sanctify you. Doesn't matter what the Baptist says, doesn't matter what the Catholic says, doesn't matter what the Muslims say, doesn't matter what the, the Presbyterians say. What did he say gives you assuredness of your salvation? The word of God. That's it. That's it. Quit following all these men. Put your faith in no man. It's correct. Go to the word of God. You have a more sure word, a more sure word of prophecy. This whole book is prophecy. You got a sure word. There's no reason for you to fall off is what Peter's saying here. Amen? No reason. If you fall off, you fell off on your own. Let's look at 19 real quick. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Were unto ye do well if ye take heed. Let me tell you something. If I have a wallet and I'm walking and I go into the locker room and the gym or wherever, and I, you think I'm going to set my wallet down? If you have a purse and you're a woman, you think you're going to set your purse down in a crowd and walk off from it? What are you going to do? You're going to take heed to protect your purse and the contents of your purse and your wallet, right? And he's telling you, take heed to take caution with the things that God has given you knowledge-wise, right? When he's opened up your knowledge, take heed that you don't lose that or take that for granted when he's opened up your knowledge, amen? Take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn. The day dawn, that's when Jesus comes back. So how long do you have to take heed? How long do you have to protect your truth, your understanding? Till you die. Till you die physically. Because the Bible says once you're dead, right, the absence of the body to be present with the Lord. So whether it's the day of his return or the day of your going, to be absence of the body is to be present with the Lord, then judgment, the Bible says. And what are you going to be judged on? Bryce just said it. Everything in this book. You're going to be judged on. And everything that you did. Let's go back to Ezekiel. We got two more verses and we're done. Hate to run y'all back and forth, but that's just the way it came to me. So let's look at Ezekiel 3, 3 to 11. Anybody want to read? Sure. Oh, go ahead, David. Ezekiel 3, 3 to 11. You want me to start on uh, one? Uh, Ezekiel 3, uh, you, you can start on one if you want to, 1 through 11. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he calls me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee into the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them they would have hearkened unto thee, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. This is... Okay, uh, we see Ezekiel being talked to here, and I'm sorry about that, guys, the computer went down, 
But I want to catch a few things here. He tells him to eat uh, in verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with the roll that I have given you. Uh, this is a spiritual thing here, but what, what he's doing is he's giving him his word. He's given us the same thing. This is this is what we are to take in and eat. This is meat for our belly, right? The word of God. And he's telling him, eat the whole thing. And then after he tells him three to eat the whole thing, he says it was in his mouth as honey. Why? Why do you think it was in his mouth as honey? Anybody? Why was it good? Why would the word of God be good to all of us? Salvation. Salvation. Y'all there? Hello, hello? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. I'm making sure everybody's here. Richard, you still here? Yes, sir. All right. Yep. David, David, everybody's here. Okay. Yeah, he, 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 it was this honey because it was the thing that was going to come to us as mankind that was going to save us or reestablish us with God. So that was like honey. He said unto me, son of man, go get thee into the house of Israel and speak with them the words unto them. The thing that he, the thing that he gave us, uh, he wants us now to give to the church, right? Truth. He wants to get us to give the thing that he put in us, the thing that he caused Ezekiel to eat, the thing that he's causing you to eat, which is truth. He's asking you now to take it to Israel or take it to the church. Verse four, then five, for thou art not sent to a people of strange speech and of hard language, but to the house of Israel. You're sent to a people that should be able to understand what you're telling them, right? Why should they be able to understand what you're telling them? Because they're God's people, right? Verse 6. Not to many people of strange speech and of hard languages. Don't miss 6. Whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent them to them, what would they do? What do the people that aren't even in the church do when you talk to them about the Bible? They, they understand. They accept what God says. Right, Derek? Remember when you went and told somebody what the Sabbath was about? Did they accept it? Yep. It's easier yep. to give someone that doesn't know, that, that isn't in religion, that language, which we're talking about spiritual language here. It's easier to teach them than it is to teach someone that's supposedly been in church their whole life. That's what he's saying here. But he said, if you go to that person that has never spoke that spiritual language, he would accept what you're saying. Think about that. Seven, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impotent or impotent and hard hearted. Well, what is he saying? They're not producing kingdom people. Right, they're not able to produce kingdom people because they don't have kingdom truth. Right, it's man's truth, it's man's philosophy. A lot of it came from the Greeks. Right, they, they're impotent in, 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 in being able to produce a child of God because there's no word of God in the place. Amen. Eight. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and their forehead strong against their forehead. Uh, their, your power, because you have the power and the word of God behind what you're saying. As an adamant harder than flint, which I made thy forehead, fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. In other words, though they're set up like the church, they act like a church, they look like a church, and you're just an individual with truth, don't be afraid of them. Because your truth is able to overcome their dogma, their doctrine, right? Because you can always state your truth, and then you can go back and reaffirm it or confirm it with the word of truth. But they can't. When, when you say 
to me the Trinity, and I say, but the Bible says, for the Lord thy God is one, who's the stronger? There's no Trinity in the Bible, but the Word of God says, for the Lord thy God is one, so mine is stronger. And then he says, uh, verse 11, and go get thee to them of the captivity and to the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them, thus said the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. The church has been in captivity for years in America. Do you understand that? What is the captivity? False doctrine, false teaching. They've been in captivity. They think they can go on Sunday and sit there and raise their hand and listen to good music and tithe and they're good. They don't have to obey. And the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. And if he says obedience is better than sacrifice, then he must have gave you something to obey. But the church keeps telling you, all you've got to do is go to the cross, be baptized, confess your sin, and you're saved. And then as soon as you leave the church, you go back into sin. Why would God do that? Is that, a, is that an unblemished sacrifice now? Oh, he's looking for an unblemished church, coming for an unblemished church. Uh, let's look, say, in Ezekiel real quick. Look at Ezekiel 33. I know you, you might not have this on your outline. Everybody still with me? Yep. yep. All right, give me a couple of more minutes. We've got two more verses. And we'll be done. Ezekiel uh, 33, 1 through 7. Not on your outline, but I just wanted to go there because it reminds me of something there real quick. Let's look at it again. Uh, chapter 33, 1 through 7. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that take his warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his inequity or his sin, but his blood will be required at the watchman's hands. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee or you as a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from God. Think about that. You can sit in church all day long, every Sunday all day long, but you ain't said nothing. God just told you those people are going to die by the sword and their blood is going to be on your hand. Right? Anybody got anything to say about that? Their blood's on your hand. Once he gives you truth, you can keep going to Baptist, you can keep going to Methodist, you can keep going to Presbyterian, but if you don't correct that doctrine with truth, if you keep going there and ignoring the sword coming and you don't blow the trump, which is the truth, the blood's on your hands. And people say, well, man, you're so serious. You, you, you know, you almost seem angry. That's why I don't want your blood on my hands. Richard, David, Eric, Christine, Braxton, Bryce, Rose, Mom. I don't want your blood on my hands, so I'm blowing my trumpet as loud as I can. As Richard said earlier, you can see by what's going on in America that the sword is coming, but who's blowing the trumpet? Huh? Son of man, I have set thee a watchman. You're a watchman. You have truth. You have understanding. God has given it to you, not so you can be happy with it and and, 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 and just like knowing things, he gave it to you for a purpose to put you upon the wall of the church. And when you see things that are wrong and you see God's going to judge that thing, you got to blow your trumpet. 
I'm blowing my trumpet. Last one right here, and we're done with this Bible study. So you might want to add that, that verse, Ezekiel 33, 1, 7, being that I know that we learned something in here. Richard told me he learned something. So now that you learn, you have an obligation to be a watchman on the wall. Hate to do that to you, but I didn't do it to you. God did it to you because he gave you truth, and he said he brings the increase. Uh, Revelations chapter 10, verse 8 through 11. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angels which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it. Did he give it to him or did he make him take it? You got to take your salvation. Quit waiting for somebody to give it to you. You got to take your salvation. Take what God has given you, the book, the word, take it and do something with it. Quit waiting for a man to sit up there in a pulpit somewhere and give you something. Amen? Take the little book. Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter. Uh-oh. We saw it being sweet first, right? Over in Ezekiel, now it's going to make your belly bitter. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. There you go. Sweet in the mouth, bitter in the belly. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy against, again, before many people and nations and tongues and kings. It was sweet. Why? Bryce said, salvation. Right? The promises, all those things came in scripture, all came in the word of God. But to get to that and to accomplish that, it has to get in the belly. And what happens when it gets in the belly? Judgment, tribulation. Amen? You got to be judged by what you just read. You got to be judged by what you just learned. You, you go through tribulation because of it. Because why? The main people that you're sent to blow the trumpet to are going to prosecute you for blowing the trumpet. I suffer a woman not to preach. Oh, that man don't know what he's talking about. He just don't like women. Tribulation. Homosexuals don't have a place at the head of the church. Oh, that man's a, 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 a what do they call people that, hom homophobic. That means I have a fear of a man that likes a man. And I don't fear no man. Again, but they will label you that. Tribulation. Right? They'll persecute you. Like I told you, 60 million Christians who refuse to bow to the Catholic Church because of the Bible, and the only thing they want to bow to was the Spirit of God, they were killed. Tribulation. The Bible says through much tribulation we enter into the kingdom. So that, that tribulation and judgment is when the word gets into your belly. And the hardest thing is to watch your family members knowing that they don't accept what God has put in them. And God, they won't accept what God has put in you to give to them. Why? Why is that hard? Why is that tribulation? Why shouldn't it? You know, me and my wife sit here and we worry about our sons. We got three sons that we raised up in the word of God. We hope they have a mouth full of the word of God and a belly full of the word of God, but they still have to go out into the world and they have to learn their way in the way of the world. Amen? And we hope uh, that it's in them enough to where they won't reject truth. They won't be fornicators. They won't be liars. They won't be adulterers. They won't uh, dabble in homosexuality or any of those other things that God calls an abomination. But to do so, they're going to have to go against the majority of the kids that they are growing up with. Amen? Because the world says it's okay. The world says, oh, you know, uh, it's okay if you wear those little tight, tight shorts to the gym. It's okay that uh, you go out with Tom and that didn't work out. So you go out with Rick now and you go out with Jesse and then it's okay. You're young. You're just learning. The world says it's okay that Tom dates every other girl that he wants to and then calls himself a man of God and then kicks him to the curb as soon as another girl comes around. All right, fornicator. 
it's okay. So you're actually having to go against the grain to be a young man and a young woman or an old man and an old woman of God. Because the Bible teaches you one thing and the world teaches you something different. Amen. And the word will call the world will call you all kind of names because you're trying to keep the word of God. And it's only going to get worse. So you better strengthen your faith through the word and through the spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this Bible study. Thank you for the people that are at the sound of my voice. I pray that your word goes out and does not come back void, as you said in your in your Bible. I pray that our ears are open to hear, our eyes are open to see. And I pray that you give us understanding, Lord. And I pray that you give us peace in this time, in this day, as Richard said, in this nation that may have gone too far, Lord. Help us to be the remnant that you pull out of her, Lord, uh, before you judge her, Lord. And help our families to be the same, Lord. And these things we pray in your name, Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Everybody good? Good. All right. Well, we're finished with our outline. We're going to look and see what's going to be next. We got a whole bunch of outlines, but I'm going to I'm going to look and see where we're going to go next from here. Pray about it, and then I'll send y'all another outline out uh, before the weekend. Uh, God bless you all. Have a wonderful afternoon, and uh, hopefully you don't throw this in the desk somewhere. Hopefully you go back and look at uh, this Bible study because I think it's a very important Bible study, not only for us as men and women of God, but uh, to uh, strengthen us and strengthen our uh, resolve. Amen. Amen. All right. Good night, folks. Have a good one.